The trouble began around 11 o'clock last night when two black males robbed a Pizza Hut restaurant in Chickasha. Authorities say the suspects got away in a red and white Cadillac and they fled eastbound towards Purcell. Well, rookie police officer Steve Samu stopped the pair about midnight last night. It began when I found out it was them that was the subjects in, involved in the bur robbery. At that time, when I stopped the vehicle, gunshots at that time were exchanged. And then just a, sh a regular shootout. Following the shootout, one of the robbers broke into a nearby house and forced a bystander there to drive him to Oklahoma City. The hostage was later released unharmed. Purcell police detectives found some interesting evidence in the suspect's Cadillac, including a fistful of dollars still in the Pizza Hut bank bag and enough ammunition to supply a small army. Officer Samu had peppered the getaway car with pistol slugs, one shot torn to the trunk, and detectives think another bullet may have hit its mark. There's, there's several that looks like blood here, here, here. He might have been. Here, uh, here, look at the hair, blue all over the dash. Evidence obtained from the Cadillac has convinced investigators to concentrate their search for the two suspects in the Oklahoma City, Dell City area. Scott Wallace, Action 4 in Purcell. The state asked for a continuance at the preliminary hearing of 21-year-old Ronald Gardner. The young man faces two charges, one of second-degree burglary, the other stems from a fire that caused $500,000 worth of damage to the Bethany Elementary School. Those charges will have to wait. Gardner has been released on bond. Another preliminary hearing has been set for March 2nd. As Gardner sat in the courtroom, students from the Bethany Elementary School spent yet another day sitting in their makeshift classrooms. Since the December 6 fire, some 400 students have been attending school in two different Bethany churches. The teacher's job is even more important now that books and aids are far and few between. Until new books come in, the students must rely on their memories as well as paper and pencil. Yeah, I talked to, I was talking to Cecil this morning. I want at least uh, you know, the staff the Teachers and students aren't the only ones doing without. The school superintendent has a makeshift office on the local college campus. The main topic in his new office is the plans for new construction. Our uh, architect has uh, prepared uh, three different proposals. Uh, we have uh, uh, made our call for a election. We'll have a special election because uh, our insurance uh, is only 90% uh, of actual cost and that is a a depreciated value and we will need uh, you know additional money to uh, in addition to the insurance money uh, to re re regain uh, our, the space we originally had. There has been a lot of progress here in reconstruction in fact there's a good possibility that at least two-thirds of the student body will be back in school Monday but these things take time and things at the Bethany Elementary School won't be back to normal until next fall. Sherry Sellers, Action 4. A viewer writes in and asks, can you be forced to sign divorce papers? My husband of 35 years wants a divorce, but I don't. Can I go to jail if I don't sign the papers? And if we are divorced, can I draw anything on his Social Security or veterans pension? Well, you cannot be forced to sign divorce papers. However, the real question is whether or not your husband can be awarded a divorce over your objection. In Oklahoma, the answer is yes. One spouse may be awarded a divorce even though it is opposed by the other spouse. However, this does not mean that you can be deprived of a voice in how your property will be divided or your divorce handled. Although generally a divorced woman will not benefit from her ex-husband's Social Security or veterans benefits, there are exceptions where the husband later dies and the duration of the marriage exceeded 10 years. For Action 4, this is Ray Vaughn with Legal Briefs. In case of an illness, equipment like this is invaluable. It monitors vital statistics, while other equipment can keep vital organs alive so they can heal. 
Under the best of circumstances, it saves lives, but in other cases, it merely prolongs death, maybe an hour, maybe indefinitely. The cost of the treatment adds to the emotional strain on the family. So far, there has been little a patient could do to spare their family, but State Senator Bernice Shedrick has proposed the Natural Death Act. It would allow a patient to relieve his family from the indecision. This, this shouldn't be the responsibility of a family to have to make that decision. That is truly should be the responsibility and the desire of the person involved. And while that person is well or able to deal with it effectively, and as I visited um, with a number of people who I, elderly people in particular in this state, in my district and in others, I felt that I began to realize this was a genuine concern. All of the equipment in this room is valuable and will save a lot of lives. But in that eventuality where nothing can save the life, the Natural Death Act is designed to make things easier on the families and the patients. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4. This isn't Tom's first brush with death. Eight years ago, he was in a motorcycle accident. Doctors then said it was a miracle he survived. They told Tom, well, that will to live has saved him a great sense of resourcefulness. I tried various ways to... ...concentrating on getting better. Tom Prince will be out of the hospital for days. Sherry Sellers, Action 4. Few bad words. Nine year old Mary Stephanie Constantykes was a full fledged Cub Scout for several months during the 1980 school year. She joined because she enjoyed the activities of the Cub Scouts as opposed to the Girl Scouts. In fact, she was an outstanding member, winning several awards. But in the spring of 1981, Stephanie was kicked out because she was a girl. This shocked and disappointed both Stephanie and her parents, so they went to court, asking she be allowed to rejoin. Tonight, John Constantine read in the paper the final ruling of the judge. He was not happy. said, we are pleased that the judge ruled in our favor. We felt the case didn't have merit. <laughs> Constantine reemphasizes that they in no way tried to conceal Stephanie was a girl. The implications that there were deliberate misrepresentations of uh, Mary Stephanie uh, as uh, not being a, a girl. Uh, there, there was no evidence to that effect. There was no intent ever from the beginning to, to indicate that. In fact, we were, uh, we were surprised at the favorable response that uh, we received from the beginning. And so... Rocky the Parrot's kidnappers have admitted to 11 business burglaries and five counts of grand larceny, including a $50,000 theft from the Galleria construction site. Police work like that just can't go unrewarded, so today, with the major media present, Rocky was cited for outstanding detective work. Rocky, on behalf of the uh, Edmund Lodge Number 136, would like to present this certificate to Rocky to recognize your support of our lodge and our community in our endeavors to prevent crime and to apprehend criminals. We hereby appoint you and elect you as an associate member of our lodge. We want to thank you for helping us out. Shake his hand. Yeah, shake his hand. <laughs> Edmund police wanted to explore every possible angle in this situation, just in case Rocky was really an accomplice to his captors, a la Patty Hearst. They wanted us to know, yes, he did pass a polygraph test. Ted Brown, Action 4 in Edmond. All right, Ted, hand it up. Yeah. A southwest Oklahoma City man returned home from work this morning and found his wife dead in their home. She had been stabbed. Police investigators at the scene speculate the woman may have returned to the house and surprised a burglar. They are looking for suspects, 
possibly driving the woman's car. It appears to us at this point that uh, she may have accosted burglars inside the residence. And uh, as a result of this, she tried, it looks like apparently tried to get out, and uh, they killed her in, in one of the rooms in the residence. You say they, any reason why you're saying? No, I'm just one? assuming that there might have been more than one. At this point, we just have to assume. Neighbors say the woman was in her mid-30s. This is a new neighborhood. The victim and her husband had been living in their home for about a month. The people living in this growing but secluded corner of the city have been trying to establish a new neighborhood watch association, trying to band together to protect one another from crime. They say that murder in the neighborhood brings that need closer to home. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4, in southwest Oklahoma City. Shortly after 7 a.m., the husband of the victim arrived home. Apparently, he's employed as a fireman for the airport, discovered his wife's body inside the residence. Uh, she'd apparently been stabbed to death. It appears to us at this point that uh, she may have accosted burglars inside the residence. And uh, as a result of this, she tried, it looks like, apparently tried to get out, and uh, they killed her in, in one of the rooms in the residence. You say they, any reason why you're saying? No, I'm just one? assuming that there might have been more than one. At this point, we just have to assume. I don't think so. I don't think that that would assure that at all. A few days ago, very dire situation and something we have to be aware Struggles of. Struggles with, the, while we made great progress last year, we may have that battle to fight over again, and that we certainly may have the right by executive order to authorize the Federal Reserve Board. I think that there were some mistakes made, and I think where, where the mistakes were made, and uh, uh, that wasn't something that a lot of us didn't try to do. I think we only failed by two or three votes to pass an amendment to put the tax cuts on a schedule that would enable us to keep the deficit under control. And I think that's critically important. We've got to get the budget in balance. We can't have the government out borrowing $110 billion, using up all the private credit, number one. And we have to have a just tax policy. And we can't be going around talking about new taxes on gasoline or telephone service or other things when we allow loopholes like this leasing policy to exist. And that was a mistake. Oklahoma City work crew started stalking many streets in anticipation of snow on its way here. The plan is not to be caught off guard like has happened in past winters. Forecasters say the snow probably won't be heavy, but would be enough to make driving conditions dangerous for motorists. Over in Piedmont, officials got to water their flooring again after it froze up in storage tanks. By overfilling the tanks, water started circulating and things got back to normal. This was only after a six inch water main had burst because of the cold weather conditions. Back in Oklahoma City at Miller's Sporting Goods store, it looked more like Miller River. 
Water from the sprinkler system flooded the entire store after a pipe bursted there because of cold weather. There wasn't much firefighters could do to salvage expensive equipment in the store. Apparently a joint in the system froze, putting too much pressure on the pipes. Four other stores also had flooding problems, but not as serious as Miller's. The store owners don't expect it will take too long to clean up the big mess. The first sign of how cold it really is can be gauged when we go out and try to start our cars. Some of us made it and some of us didn't. But with a little help, even the cold weather can be beaten and we can be on our way to work. Ed Stewart, Action 4, Oklahoma City. In the midst of all the heat from that fire, Governor George Nye told the legislators he planned to dismantle the Welfare Department. But today, Governor Nye admitted that that dismantling is not taking place. Nye says he wants to proceed slowly right now until he determines how much caution is required. All I have done is urge caution as we continue to look at that department. What I want to be certain of, and that's my only caution, and I think as governor I have to have this reservation that in my desire to dismantle or my desire to have full oversight, I do not in any way want to jeopardize the recipients of the needed programs that we have and the possibility of the department being hampered, particularly this year, in its uh, dispersal of funds to recipients. Now, some people will say that's backing off, and it is. But the reason it is backing off is that I want to make sure that I don't do anything that would hurt the program. Authorities are looking for the gunman who stuck up local federal savings and loan of Shawnee around 1130 this morning. Witnesses say the bandit dropped part of the loot when he flooded to a nearby trailer park. A suspicious car found near the scene led officers to a rural area just east of Tecumseh. Highway patrol troopers sealed off the area while a patrol plane searched for the suspect. Yeah, Nervous uh, nearby residents well, armed themselves first, in case the uh, bandit uh, tried to make a run for it. I went more that gate through back there where, you know, if he is around here, he can't sneak in the back here, homie. Right. Over this hill crest is where he was seen on the other section. We should have it sealed fairly well. If y'all will follow me up here, I'll set you on these hill crests where we can watch it, then we'll start the house and start pushing until y'all just watch that. Armed with shotguns and automatic weapons, lawmen carefully searched each home in the area. This house was of special interest since it appeared a door had been jimmied. However, so far the search has been fruitless. Authorities have not yet released the name of the suspect. He's been described as a white male wearing a blue and gold shirt and blue jeans. Officers say he's armed with a 44 Magnum pistol. Scott Wallace, Action 4, near Tecumseh. It may not be reflected in the immediate future so much as it will be in the, in the uh, distant future, depending on how severe the trees are damaged. The reports are that if the freeze continues over a period of days, they will lose some trees. If this happens, it takes a while to get production uh, geared up again, and so we'll naturally have some increases in prices. This almost invariably happens that consumers pay the price, uh, regardless of, uh, of the cause of the damage, and uh, eventually that will get around to us.
The murders occurred just inside their jurisdiction, so Canadian County authorities came to the Oklahoma City Jail to claim their prisoners. He's the innocent one. He didn't do it. That's 25-year-old Marty Ray Artizone. He and his 22-year-old brother Robert were arrested late Monday night at their homes on two charges each of first-degree murder. They are accused of killing Russell Lee Wilson of Norman and Lisa K. Cusick of Nakoma Park. The two were found dead in their car just south of Lake Overholzer. They had been shot several times and Wilson had been stabbed repeatedly. Action 4 learned the killings were probably drug-related. After a night in the Canadian County Jail, the Artisone brothers will be arraigned tomorrow. Ed Stewart, Action 4 at Oklahoma City Police Headquarters. Most of the OU athletic program's budget is supported by football games, and that budget runs into the millions of dollars. Even so, the athletic department has a deficit of $350,000, and one way to get more money is to raise ticket prices, which OU Regents did today. Single game tickets to the public will go from $12.50 to $15, an increase of $2.50. Student season tickets will go from $22.50 to $26. Texas tickets, which are worth more than their weight in gold, will go from $12.50 to $15 for students and from $15 to $18 for the public. Students around the campus are not happy with the increase, but most say they'll pay it. It's unfortunate, but it's worth the cost. I don't think it's fair because we're students here and we have the worst seats in the house and the people that pay a lot of money get the good seats and we're ending up paying more money for lousy seats. I don't know. I guess it's all right. They weren't that high. It's probably worth it, though, to see if they're going to play good. <laughs> but if they're going to have a bad season like last time, I don't know if it's worth it. <laughs> of course it means something, but just because they had a bad season doesn't mean you should quit going to games or quit being a fan. Another way to get more money is through television rights. Currently, the National Collegiate Athletic Association negotiates all TV contracts. OU has filed suit in federal court to change that. They say they could negotiate their own television contracts and make a lot more money. The possibilities of profit are speculative at this point in time. However, we believe that by entering into the marketplace and having the opportunity to negotiate the best contract that we can, both as to public subscription and other forms of cable cast and pay television, that the market may be basically unlimited. But Ward added it could be years before that suit is finally settled. So the cost of a seat in this stadium will be a little bit higher next season, but maybe with a little added revenue from television rights, regions can keep from raising ticket prices again anytime soon. Ted Brown, Action 4 from Owen Stadium. Should we have nuclear power or not? Additional thirteen point four million dollars to public service company as the question of whether public service companies should proceed in the 12 percent municipal street lighting 12 percent metered outdoor lighting i'm not too anxious to speculate about what public service company might do public service company has two co-owners as i mentioned earlier that have an interest in this project and they have an investment that they need to protect in addition to the public service company's investment I will be surprised if the public service company and their co-owners do not decide to cancel this project. That's my personal opinion.
The house fire on Southwest 43rd Street early yesterday afternoon was typical of the day's blazes. Investigators say the fire began when the home's occupant tried to thaw his home's frozen water pipes with a paper torch. The torch caught the grass on fire, starting a small blaze inside the house. Damage was confined to one side of the home. About the same time, a few blocks away, another homeowner had a similar result when he tried to heat up his water pipes with a propane torch. Uh, I was under the house trying to thaw the pipes out. Everything. With little, bottle, little protein bottles, everything, torch. Like I said, I come out from under the house and it was on fire. And the only thing I knew to do is call the fire department. The fire department cautions homeowners against heating up frozen pipes with open flames. Instead, they advise residents with frigid pipes to contact a licensed plumber. It'll cost a few dollars for the professional pipe heating, but it'll be a lot cheaper than paying for a new house. Sherry Sellers, Action 4. A 14-year-old Bethany viewer writes and says, My parents recently made a will which directs that in the event of their death I'm to go live with my aunt. However, I would prefer to go live with my cousin. Is there any way the court would listen to my preference? Well, your parents' decision of a guardian in their will is not binding on the court and is merely persuasive with regard to who the court should select as your guardian. The judge would certainly consider your preference and would ultimately decide your guardian based upon what is in your best interest. Should your parents die after you reach age 18, then you will have the opportunity of deciding yourself with whom you should live. For Action 4, this is Ray Vaughn with Legal Briefs. A Norman viewer says she and her husband own 10 acres of unimproved land in Pottawatomie County, but do not own the mineral rights to the property. Are they entitled to any part of the profit should oil be discovered on the property? And also is their permission necessary in order for an oil company to drill for oil on the property? Well, since you do not own any of the mineral rights, you would not be entitled to any of the profits from the oil or gas should it be discovered under your property. Further, if an oil company has leased the mineral rights for exploration, then they do not need your permission in order to drill. However, you would be entitled to damages caused to the surface of the property from the drilling process. For Action 4, this is Ray Vaughn with Legal Briefs. An Oklahoma City viewer says that she has some large pecan trees with limbs that hang over her neighbor's fence, but do not touch anything. She says that her neighbor contends that the pecans that grow on these limbs belong to him, and he's been gathering them. Is this true, and if not, what recourse is available to her? I believe I would allow the neighbor to gather the pecans on his side of the fence. The reason being that Oklahoma law provides that any growth, such as limbs, that extend from one person's property over onto another, whether they touch anything or not, may be removed at the property line without liability on the part of the neighbor removing the limbs. Therefore, your neighbor could cut the limbs of your pecan trees on the property line, if he were so inclined. For Action 4, this is Ray Vaughn with Legal Briefs. <laughs> 